our live streams, Twitter Live, YouTube Live, and Facebook Live. And so let's get the show on the road. And please do uh, contribute any comments. Your questions are uh, so often way better than mine. Uh, and, and I really appreciate that. Uh, welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're talking about global climate change with special guests, Dr. Nate, or Nat, sorry. Uh, uh, let's, let's try this again. I'm going to do the intro again. Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we are talking about global climate change with special guests, Nat Cohen, uh, Cohen uh, president of the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, Max Holmes, president CEO of the Woodwell Climate Research Center, and Eric uh, Pika, president of the Friends of the Earth and Friends of the Earth Action. And a reminder, Zoom attendees, that we will take three snap polls during the show and we'll announce results. And your questions submitted to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen will be included in our discussion. So thank you all for joining us, Nat. I'm so sorry for mangling your name uh, again. I, I really appreciate your, your tolerance of that. Uh, and um, I'm going to throw this over to Max um, uh, real quick. Uh, 2022 was declared amongst Earth's warmest years on record by four different scientific agencies. This was a few weeks ago. And in the last year, uh, years, the world has suffered record-breaking floods, droughts, heat waves, fires, typhoons, tornadoes, and temperature changes that has caused widespread human and economic loss and damage to biological ecosystems on a massive scale. So Max, uh, just starting with you, could you give us a quick summary of what's going on? And then let's, let's start talking about uh, how do we actually deal with this? Because just sort of looking at the problem and studying it, isn't enough. We have to we have to inflect to action. Uh, Max. Yeah, happy to do so. And thanks for the opportunity, Mark. It's, it's great to be on your show. Um, you gave a pretty good list of some of the impacts we're seeing already with respect to climate change. And it's been over not too many. You don't have to go back too many years when scientists were talking about climate change. And for most people, it was sort of a theoretical construct. It was something that was going to happen sometime in the future. But sort of anybody who's opening a newspaper or, or looking out their window or experiencing this planet we live in, they're actually seeing the impacts of climate change now, whether it's the you know warming that we're all experiencing, whether it's sea level rise, increased storms, increased fires. If you're in the Arctic, you'd witness permafrost thaw and on and on and on. So yeah, it's been this kind of remarkable shift. Again, it's what scientists have been saying for a long time. I've been saying for a long time, but even uh, you know, for me or for a scientist, it was something that ah, we weren't really experiencing. Um, we were imagining it out there somewhere. And it sort of arrived, I think, sooner and, and, and with a greater uh, uh, vengeance than we imagined not so long ago. And we kind of go around the world, right? I mean, if you just look at California, the, the fires on the one hand and the floods on the other, right? You, you, you go to uh, York, which has a incredibly temperate uh, winter um, that we have. So everybody says, okay, it's a temperate winter and we have a fuel sh uh, shortage uh, and, that's, and, and that's good. But you can go then to Pakistan and you've got the, these incredible floods or the failures of monsoons. Uh, Nat, how do you see the entire uh, picture when you, when you start to inflect from the, the symptoms that we're all experiencing? Um, how do you see human response to this we have to adjust on uh, on the one hand because we're going to be living in this world for a long time. But is it possible to actually undertake action that addresses the problem and reverses some of the damage? Yeah, um, great questions, Mark, and thanks thanks for me as well for um, for having me on the program. And it's it's great to be on with Max and with Eric as well. Um, I, just a couple points to your to you know building on what Max said, and then to your point about. Um, what, what are starting to think about some of the solutions and, and what we can do. The first thing I would just start to build on what Max said, and of course he knows this uh, as, as well as anybody, Woodwell is a really terrific scientific institution. One thing that it's important for people to recognize is, you know, we can trace, scientists can trace the impacts that climate is having. You mentioned some of those specific uh, events, the, the floods in Pakistan, the heat wave in Europe, 
Um, we see, see, you know, we, we see uh, Hurricane Harvey several years ago with all of the rainfall. You know, it used to be 10 years ago, people would say, well, any one single event, we can't ascribe to climate change. But actually, we now can ascribe those extreme weather events we're seeing as, as being more probable, more likely than they would have been in a world that hadn't already warmed more than one degree Celsius, almost two degrees Fahrenheit uh, in the last century. So we, events we are so numerous that they're becoming a trend line, aren't they? It's aren't they? Be, exactly. So it's not, you know, you might think, oh, maybe it's just this is a, an off year, but it's actually we can see the, the signal of climate change in those events. And the other thing I'll note, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the world's sort of leading scientific body, when it came out with a report a couple of years ago on the impacts, as you noted, Mark, this is happening everywhere. It's happening all over the world. And that's a new thing that, again, we weren't seeing 10 years ago. I will say, and I know we'll talk about solutions and we'll talk about maybe, you know, the, the, what the world, the, the path forward looks like. We, there are signs of progress. Um, I mean, I, you know, at the same time as we're seeing the impacts coming and they're going to only get worse, we're also seeing, if you look ahead to where humanity is headed, if you look at the kind of projections around what warming will look like. 10 years ago, we were also headed much more towards three point three and a half, four degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. That's almost eight degrees Fahrenheit. Now, as a result of some of the policies we put in place, things like the Paris Climate Agreement we can talk about, now the projections are much more in the range of two and a half to 2.7 degrees. That's still really high and we need to do much more, but we can make progress. And if we continue doing what we're doing, we can make further progress. And I know we'll come back to that. Well, one of the things that that, that strikes me is that it used to be that uh, you had the industrialized uh, countries uh, interacting with the developing world, the global South, in this way where th the industrialized uh, uh, countries would extract resources or extract agricultural uh, products. And the, um, the global South would supply those products, but not necessarily have uh, manufacturing capability. And nowadays we have an, a, a different negotiation that's taking place. The global South is beginning to come back and say, you want our products, you want our extracted minerals. You have to start thinking about the impact of your pollution on our environment, on our floods, on our droughts, on our economies. Um, Eric, how do you see this, this sort of whole earth kind of a, a negotiation that's going on where different parts of our globe enabled by modern communication and, and uh, a, a more um, uh, equitable negotiating platform. How do you see this actually um, unfolding uh, in a way that, that helps to solve this problem and, and start to deliver some of the uh, changes that Matt uh, was uh, was referring to. No, Mark, that's a good question. Again, thank you for having me on, and you know, it's also a joy to be on with Nat and with Max. Uh, the The international conversation that you just asked about has been embedded in the international negotiations since the Kyoto Protocols in 1992. Uh, there is this term called common but differentiated responsibility, which was a core tenet in the Kyoto Protocols within the UNF, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Can you Change. Explain that 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 concept. Yeah, and so what it means is is essentially those who polluted the most, who most contributed to the climate um, crisis, have a greater responsibility to take action. And that action is through, you know, greater mitigation, through more dollars, more climate finance, uh, going to countries that, to poorer countries. Uh, and so it's just kind of bedrock principle within the, the, the international negotiations that just says, you who are most responsible, for the pollution are most responsible for leading the globe and helping countries leapfrog in technology. And so I think what you saw com coming out of uh, Sharm El Sheikh is this concept called loss and damage, which has been kind of a, a, a conversation over the last five years or 10 years, which essentially set up kind of this recognition that the countries that are least responsible for climate change and for the crisis are being kind of adversely impacted the most, the Pakistani floods, for example, and that there needs to be a mechanism within the UN context, within the international context, 
that helps finance at a greater extent that we have seen up to this point, those countries to either leapfrog in technology to do the adaptation, because some of these countries aren't, you know, we're not going to be able to develop how we how we've done in the past. And some of these, you know, Pakistan, uh, you had is is a different country now because of the flood so that they have to develop in a different way and so the loss and damage concept is about how do we put dollars and move resources into these countries to to follow a different development path and to actually then uh adapt to the the damages that are occurring in those countries and that it is kind of the wealthier countries that that have been historically the responsible parties for the climate emissions uh, greenhouse gas emissions, they have a responsibility to provide those resources. So are you saying, Eric, that since I'm wearing a shirt that was made in Pakistan, and I've got a computer with uh, minerals that are that are um, uh, mined out of Africa, and I've got a car that um, that uh, is, is a gas uh, burning car, and my life is enabled by all these logistics, uh, international flights and, mm. and shipping and so on that moves my yogurt across from Holland over to uh, to my Safeway here. That I'm actually, I actually bear a disproportionate responsibility, more responsibly than a peasant who lives in, or an agricultural worker who lives in Bangladesh where my shirt is made and who is now dispossessed by floods. I bear responsibility for that person's misfortune. Is that basically what you're saying? From a per capita perspective, the United States, the global North emits more climate change, right? We just individually, we do. But I think that's probably the wrong framing because okay. the because individual choices help, but you need broad-based policy to solve the problem. And so you need, you know, as an individual, we we can control what we what we purchase and what you know we, whether we use renewable energy or an electric vehicle, but it is governments of the world that require the capital resources to make the changes that require the policies required to phase out of of oil and gas products to to finance the renewable energy. Uh, revolution that's occurring as a part of the Inflation Reduction Act. You know, it is big government policy that we need at this moment across the globe and unified big government policy across the globe to really and deeply address what's going on. So we can focus on like the the individual carbon content of the electric EV vehicle that's built in China and shipped to the United States, but that misses the point is that, you know, the individual only is given so many choices because the government policies up to this point have actually rewarded and subsidized a very extractive oriented uh, economic theory, right? We oil and gas and coal has been the kind of the dominant energy source for the last 150, 175 years that has been subsidized and supported by government. And we've been subsidizing it by not regulating the pollution. And so it takes a government intervention into the economy and a big one to steer us off of that direction. So let's let's go into, I understand the government side. Can, can we talk a little bit about whether there might also be market-based solutions, Max? Uh, Nat, you want to get a piece of this? Maybe I'll jump in and then Max, you, you may want to follow as well. I know Woodville does lots of work on this too. So one thing I, I would just agree with what Eric said about the role of government, even when we think about things like market-based policy. So I'm, I'm an economist. That's where I, that's the world I come from. Um, and, you know, one of the things that governments can do is put in place policies that help create the economic incentives that markets need to work well, right? So in the absence of uh, government policies, we're going to, we're going to keep seeing more pollution. We're going to keep seeing more people, you know, essentially using the atmosphere as a dumping ground for carbon dioxide. And that's what we've been seeing. And that's why we have the climate impacts that we talked about in the beginning. So governments can do policies that help shape the markets that help shape market incentives. That can be things like carbon taxes or emissions trading programs, which are really market-based systems that are set up by the government. That's Those are in place in some places. Europe has such an approach. California has an approach. You see some of that in Korea and bits and pieces in Japan and elsewhere. Or it could be more regulatory approach that 
maybe as a little bit of a different way to create some of those incentives. I mean, there are better and worse ways, I think, to do the policy, but government has a role and markets have a role. So it's not an either or. On the market well, markets, side- What you're yeah. saying is that markets, market rules are set by us. The right? market rules the are gonna are be us. shaped by the government, exactly. And so we need to think about both of those things. I mean, I know we'll probably come back to talking more about the role of companies, the role of business. That's something that my organization thinks a lot about. And it's true that companies can do a lot and they can do more to help. And we need those government policies in place to help structure those incentives. Max, what do you think? Well, I agree with everything I've heard, and maybe I'll throw out, throw out a specific example. So we work on forests around the world. We focus on forests, among other things, because of the huge amount of carbon that's locked up in trees. We need to keep that carbon in trees out of the atmosphere. But the fact is, it's sort of going the other direction. Trees are coming down for a variety of reasons. Um, that's putting more carbon, more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, leading to more warming. It can go the other direction. If we protect and restore forests, photosynthesis pulls carbon out of the atmosphere. So how do we, how do we set the conditions to, to head in that direction? A lot of our work is in the Amazon, the largest tropical forest, a huge amount of carbon locked up in there. And the Amazon's on, under all kinds of different pressures that contribute to deforestation. Agriculture is one. Mining is another. Um, uh, and, and then there are also natural things that are happening uh, that are linked to climate change, like fire increasing and so on. So how do we make it? Um, and, and for the longest time, I've sort of wished that people thought like me and my colleagues think and recognize the intrinsic value of the forests and the biodiversity and would fight to save those. And that motivates some people. But if you try to put yourself in the, in, in the seat of a landowner who can make more money now by chopping down the trees than by um, keeping those trees standing and they're barely scraping by, they're not, they don't have the lifestyle that probably all of us on this call have. It, you, got, you have to recognize the pressures uh, the that they're under. That, that four to eight billion trees are cut down annually on a net basis. So after planting and so on, it's, it, it's a huge, huge continual deforestation that is done in the in individual interests, right? Yeah, that's right. And, you know, and yeah, r restoring forests, planting trees is a really important thing, but even more important is protecting the the existing mature forest that we have. It takes a long time to restore a forest. So, yeah, we think a lot about, okay, how do you get the incentives right um, to the landowners, to those who are currently doing the deforesting to keep the trees standing? Matt, I want to go back to you as the economist. Is this just a matter of, of learning how to count? In other words, if we look at if we look at trees and we look at trees as just wood product, then we cut it down and we sell the wood. But if instead we we count trees as having a, a range of other benefits and we start to count the aggregate benefits of, of, of having a tree versus cutting them down, right? And figuring out other ways to deal with uh, the need for structural timber and so on and so forth, maybe changing the pricing. Is this just a matter of we haven't been counting the right things and as a result, of, the, of not counting the right things for you know several hundred years, we end up with uh, with with uh, with damage to the climate that that results in floods, fires, and all these other you know weather events and so on. Is it are we do we have a counting issue and we just have to learn how to count? So I think it starts with learning how to count and learning what to count and what to value. Um, so I love the example of forests. That's something I've worked on in, in, in my career as well. Obviously, Woodwell is a leader on that. And, and we talk a lot about making forests worth more alive than dead. And that's really the challenge. So it, it starts with counting and being able to understand the value of, of carbon in standing trees, the value to the atmosphere. But then it has to also be backed up by those policies, by some form of incentives. I'll give you a quick example on this, again, in the forest theme. Um, I was part of a group a couple of years ago um, that helped launch, actually, I guess it was two years ago, that helped launch something called the LEAF Coalition. Now this builds on a lot of work that was done by Max and his colleagues and others in the scientific community. And the idea behind the LEAF Coalition, it's all about protecting tropical rainforests and doing that by creating incentives to make them worth more valuable alive than dead, and doing that in part by something called the voluntary carbon market. Companies have this ability to, when they make climate commitments, they can meet those commitments in part by buying uh, high quality carbon credits. We can talk about this because I think Eric probably, there's maybe some area where we have different, we have different views on some of this. It'd be good to talk about it. But the LEAF Coalition, the idea is, well, look, if companies are going to buy carbon credits to meet their commitments, 
let's give them the opportunity to buy credits that represent real reductions in emissions that are resulting from tropical deforestation. The companies are, this is a way for them to demonstrate to their customers and employees and investors they're doing something right for the climate. And it's a way to help drive finance and channel finance into protecting forests in the Amazon and elsewhere. There's a lot of guardrails you got to put on that. We could talk about if we wanted to spend in detail, but that's an example of an approach in that case that's actually voluntary, but it's supported by governments, Norway and the UK and the US, but it's an example of doing something that tries to change those economic incentives in order to make forests worth more alive than dead. And I think that we're all we're all cognizant of the fact that that some of these uh, markets, particularly in their early forms, um, they they're kind of artificial. They can be gamed. They are not necessarily tightened up uh, uh, yet. Um, Eric, um, uh, what what is your view of this of this uh, market based approach? Are you skeptical? Skeptical, yes. I mean, I think the some of the how the conversation has changed is that you know a lot of times the early conversations of markets were really markets without the people in them and so by that i mean like there are communities in the united states even where you could argue a market-based solution could actually concentrate pollution because it could be more um more cost effective to kind of do to to, to load in a pollution plant uh, and reduce elsewhere uh the same is true with forests right and so you can you can protect tropical rainforest but if you do so at the exclusion of people and the indigenous folks that have been in those forests managing those forests in a way for centuries that has kind of led to kind of what we consider amazon forest in many regards like then the markets become wrong uh you know broadly markets and this is where i agree with with nat and, and max markets are a function of who creates them and so you a government entity will can create the market and can kind of put in all the sideboards all the justice elements all the people element into it to make sure that those markets don't go awry i think where there is there's disagreement uh is like we're we're beyond the point of voluntary markets like we're we're at the point to where uh you know a company trying to offset its emissions by buying tropical rain for, by trying to protect rainforest like we're kind of that would have been a theory 20 years ago when we weren't at the moment we're at right now where we're going to breach 1.5 degrees celsius likely this year or next year we're kind of at the moment where the the scientific economy dictates we just have to do everything now as hard and fast as we can Right. And that to me kind of argues that if that company is trying to buy an offset, we should be telling it, you know, through EPA regulation or sort of some other regulatory approach that they need to reduce their carbon emissions now over the course of, you know, five years or whatnot. And then we also need to be kind of cracking down on Ill illegal foresting through like the Lacey Act, which is uh, controls like illegal uh, kind of monitors what comes in the United States. We need to crack down on companies that are that are that are you know in Brazil in particular that are chopping down rainforests for agricultural products to increase uh, uh, grazing for cattle or whatnot. Like there, there are things that we have to do that we can do a lot better that I think the voluntary markets are a poor substitute in like a more robust government intervention into what it requires to solve this crisis and the, at, the, at the multiple levels that it requires. You know, it, we just did uh, um, a couple polls, and uh, one is, uh, why do you think climate change is happening? 90% of the people said uh, it's caused by human activity. 10% uh, said it's a natural cycle. It's, it's part of the natural cycle. Um, then what was really interesting is that we, we then asked, uh, what concerns you most about climate change? Now, embedded in there is kind of an answer, because the last... The last answer is other things worry me more. If it's part of the natural cycle, it would be natural to say other things worry me more. But everybody answered various things, extreme weather, economic damage, effect on food supply, loss of wildlife habitat, and so on. So what you've got here is not necessarily a conscious connecting of the dots by everybody, but an unconscious connecting of the dots by 100% of the people, even people who are skeptical about some of the evidence unconsciously, we're all connecting the dots of what we're seeing, which what we're experiencing. So I, I think that's really interesting because as soon as you have human consensus, you can get people rowing together, can't you? 
Yeah, that's right. And I'd say that 100% of the people are right. So climate change, <laughs> the, the, the 90% who said it's human cost, will give them full credit if they're talking about the recent climate change that we're seeing. What we're seeing in recent years, recent decades, and the last 150 years since we've started going full in with fossil fuels. And uh, the other 10%, I'll also give them credit, and I'll, I'll say they're talking about the longer time frame. Climate change is independent of human activities. If you go back, and you can see that record over hundreds of thousands of years, Earth's climate changes a lot. The last 10,000 years, we've had this remarkable period of relatively stable climate up until the very recent decades. Over that 10,000 year period, not surprisingly, not coincidentally, we went from one or two million people, one or two million people 10,000 years ago to now 8 billion people right now. That happened in large part because we had this anomalously stable climate, people could put down roots, develop agriculture, develop civilization, et cetera. What we're doing now is pushing it, pushing the climate really hard, um, uh, changing it really rapidly. And that's tough to deal with, with 8 billion people and national borders and so on. And we're changing the atmosphere. We're changing the, we're changing the atmosphere. We're changing the land. We're changing through uh, plastics in the ocean. We're changing the composition of the ocean the acidification of various parts of the ocean in particular. So we're actually, we're having this, this massive uh, effect. So let's, let's go around uh, this, this, uh, this table. If I were after this discussion to spend the rest of the day accomplishing something and the rest of this year accomplishing something, me, one person, multiplied by as many people as there are there are on the earth. What should I be doing? Matt, what, do you, what should I be doing after today? On climate, um, with respect to climate. I, I, so I, I'm a big believer, this is gonna sound maybe funny, but I think that one of the most important things people can do and that people listening in can do is engage on climate through whatever ways, through, through politics, if you're interested in that. Um, have, I mean, climate ought to be a part of your vote whatever party you're a part of. Eric mentioned the role, we've been talking about the role of governments. That, this is a critical issue for government policy. And so make climate a part of your vote, but also talk about it with people. I think, you know, the, the, the surprising degree is how much, you know, there still is uncertainty. Is it really happening? It is, it is happening and it is being caused by humans. And, and I think the more that people talk about it, engage each other, and then we can start to build that consensus towards uh, towards how to provide solutions. Obviously, if you're able to do things like drive less, maybe eat, you know, maybe eat differently with a little bit of a lower carbon footprint, maybe use renewable electricity if you have that option and where you live, those are all good things too. But fundamentally, this is going to happen as a result of social change, as a result of policy change. And that's why I think actually engagement, engagement of the political process and engagement with your neighbors and your friends and your relatives is, is so important. You've got my nefarious plan pegged, right? Uh, my nefarious plan is to learn from three guys who are smarter than me, right? And and that's the, the whole idea of being informed by other people and just sort of talking about it is such an important important way to go. Uh, Max, what is your suggestion for how uh, I conduct myself? I love Nat's answers, and so I totally agree with those. I'd say in the engagement, avoid argument nobody's mind has ever changed in this thing when you get into an argument. Now, one of the unfortunate things that's happened um, over the last decade or so is it's become a partisan issue and a very polarizing issue. It didn't used to be that way. It shouldn't be that way. There are the solutions need to involve politics and different political persuasions can have different ideas about what the right policy should be. That's the discussion we should be having. It shouldn't be, you know, is climate change real? Are humans causing it? We're beyond that point. Um, I like to, when I, and I, I love to talk to people who have different thoughts than I do about this issue. And I like to kind of um, figure out where we diverge. And what I find is we actually agree on a lot. Uh, you know, you can kind of, nobody can, there's no legitimate way to argue about the atmospheric CO2 concentration uh, over the last you know, 150 years and what's happening with CO2 and where that CO2 came, came from. Um, where I think the argument, the disagreement, as I said, legitimately comes into play. It's what we should do about that. Different parties may have different ideas uh, and that, that's, that's great. But um, yeah, I find, 
I, I love these conversations that seem like uh, people may have absolutely different ideas about climate change. You often find that we're not so far apart. And I think when, when you have that realization, that's the kind of progress we need. I'm trying to limit my use of single use plastics. I'm trying to not buy water that's transported on trucks and steam and steamships from France. Um, I'm trying to uh, to um, uh, think about uh, my next purchase and and how that is going to affect uh, uh, the planet in the long term. It's not a big deal. I don't I, I don't live the life of uh, of a monk, uh, but uh, I, I try to change things just a little bit. Eric, what kind of advice do you have? for me going forward so that I can act in a little bit uh, of a different way. You know, Nat Max's uh, uh, admonition that we should be talking to each other and yeah. and uh, listening to each other and, and uh, becoming advocates for the climate is, is really important. What other advice do you have? I, I mean, I, I agree with Nat and Max and part of this is just scale. And so we have to take your individual virtue and figure out how you can scale up all the individual virtue decisions that you're making and folks who are who are who are eliminating plastics and who are who are reducing their travel you know and so and to me that is conversation and then you kind of you scale up the individual virtue into a political social movement right because the solutions to climate change and to many of our environmental problems and frankly, a lot of our societal problems is just creating the political will to be able to adopt the policies and to frankly push back against those who have a, a economic benefit to the status quo, right? The oil and gas industry, the coal industry, the petrochemical industry that's creating the single use plastics that's pushing it out. And so, you know, there are consumer guides you know, galore. There are labeling programs galore in the United States and globally. Uh, many of them are really good that allow you to make informed decisions. But again, I think what you hear from Nat, Max, and myself is like, how do you take that individual virtue and scale it into political dialogue? And that means talking to friends, talking to neighbors, talking to folks who may not agree with you, and then figuring out how to approach political decision makers about what you want to see happen and then vote and use your vote as the consequence to whether or not they are doing the right thing or the wrong thing for what you believe in. Uh, because your purchasing power is a firm belief about what you believe where the planet should be going. And there's no reason why you shouldn't transfer that belief into a vote or multiple votes with your friends to kind of push political change as necessary. Let's also uh, come back to some of the points that you've all made about understanding the, the lives of others in different parts of the world, right? And, and understanding that uh, somebody who is uh, trying to figure out how to feed their family um, and cutting down a tree in order to do that, um, that person is living their lives and we have to understand what, what that is. We're going to uh, create a world in which that person doesn't have to cut down the tree to, um, to feed their family. We have to start taking responsibility for treating our brothers and sisters like brothers and sisters and trying to help them to navigate uh, their lives as well. Uh, we are very fortunate, the four of us here, that we have our electronics and we are in our comfortable homes. But most people on the world in the world do not live in this way. And that whole idea of us trying to meet our brothers and sisters in, 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 um, in concert as we try to solve these problems is so very important. Dr. Uh, Nat uh, 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 Kohan, uh, uh, president of the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, Dr. Max Holmes, president and CEO of the Woodwell Climate Research Center, and Eric Pika, president of the Friends of the Earth and Friends of the Earth Action, Thank you so much for sharing your insights, your wisdom, and please thank your boards, thank your, your colleagues, uh, please thank your funders, uh, and please thank your community. You are really helping us to navigate this, this uh, area and your wisdom uh, really can inform each of our actions. We very much appreciate it.